Good morning, Eleanor. Almost good afternoon. Should we get out of bed? Well, I can feel Buddy stretching under the covers. Maybe we'll stay here a little longer, huh? Yeah. Good girl. Let go of it. Let go of it. All right, look at <laughs> Hello, buddy. Hello, oh, handsome boy. Oh, yeah. Hi, good morning. I think it's time for treats. I do. Oh, my handsome boy. Hi. Okay. Let's get out of bed. What do you think? Boop. Ugh, this is mind-numbing. Why do I have to know about batteries that go inside mobility devices? As a flight attendant, why do I have to know? I'm not in charge of these things. Ugh, so frustrating. Ugh, my brain hurts. Oh, I got cat hair on my nose. Hey guys, how are ya? Welcome back to my channel. It's me, Steven. It is March 5th. It's harder and harder to see the small font on my watch. If you know, you know. Uh, it is 1.29 in the afternoon. I've spent the whole day so far lounging in bed, just relaxing. I still have a little bit of a cough, with me, which made getting to sleep last night a little difficult. So I took the last little bit of NyQuil that I had left in the bottle, uh, and that made me sleep for like 11 hours. It was great. Um, uh, I lounged in bed with Buddy. He crawls under the blankets with my knees up like a little tent. He loves to hang out down there. Eleanor, I had her on my chest while I was brushing her. Uh, it's a happy space for all three of us. And we lay there until I have to get up to pee. That's, what, that, that's how we do our mornings here in the Pereira household. I, I just noticed that my shirt matches my painting behind me. How crazy is that? Um, let's see. So um, I just had breakfast, or I guess it's lunch now. Uh, I had a cereal bowl full of raisin bran. I love raisin bran. The Walmart Extra Raisin. Raisin bran. Love it. Um, and I had a cereal bowl <clears throat> full of cereal. I know that sounds like, well, of course you did, Stephen. It's cereal. Well, for me... A box of cereal used to be, really honestly, three, maybe four servings if I was, you know, being rational. Um, I don't know why I didn't weigh 400 pounds. I really don't know why. Because uh, I would eat, like, literally a serving bowl, like a vegetable serving bowl that would hold mashed potatoes or something. I would eat that full of cereal. That's that's what, That was a meal for me. So today eating a cereal bowl full of cereal felt like a very mature thing. I'm almost 55 years old. I'm just learning how to eat. Uh, remedial eating. But um, let's see. So today um, I decided I'm going to knock out one of my three remaining um, online modules in preparation for recurrent. And this morning, I've got three of them. I've, I've been lazy. I could have had them done last week, but these last three, I like to keep until near the end, um, before just before recurrent, because things like hazmat, the nine classes of hazmat, which one doesn't have any subgroups, blah, 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 those things slip right out of my brain. So I like to hold on to doing them until before recurrent, but not too, you know, too close. Uh, but uh, hidden hazards. Did you know in the United States, you're not allowed to carry a refrigerator or an air conditioner on board an aircraft? Why do I have to know these things? Aren't there other people whose job it is to know these things who will be customer facing before they face me? Oh, sorry, sir. You can't carry that air conditioner. <laughs> <Boy. sighs> uh, but I'm being paid to know these things. So here we are. Uh, so I'm going to finish this one module. I have two more. I figure I'll do one tomorrow and one the next day. 
The rest of the day, I really don't have any plans. I am on recurrent. Uh, and with my airline, I am very happy to say this because uh, it, it's not the same with most airlines. With my airline, when you're on reserve, they can only call you 10 hours during the course of a day. Isn't that nice? A lot of airlines, most airlines, you're on reserve 24 hours a day for however many days you have in your reserve block. They can call you at 3 or 4 in the morning if they want to. Uh, with my airline, they can call me at 3 in the morning as long as I am set for that time. For the, Am I making any sense? They can call me within a 10-hour period. I get to choose that period. It's based on seniority, but so I get to choose, I got to choose my reserve period. I think it's C. So crew scheduling can call me between 7 a.m. and 5 p.m., but they can't call me before or after. If they do by accident, I can, um, I can tell them to check their manual, but also I get paid two extra hours of um, pay when I file a ticket with the union for things like that. So if they call me, they call me but I don't think they're going to call me. So I don't know what else I'm going to do today. I'm thinking of doing a question and answer video. I've already been talking for almost five minutes now, so this video might not be the shortest ever, but I'm thinking of doing a question and answer video. Um, if you leave comments in my um, the comment section under my videos, once I've read that comment, I, I heart it. I love it. So that you know that I read your comment because I don't reply to every comment. Uh, but um, if I don't reply to your comment or I don't love it, it's because I have read it, but I haven't come to approach what is probably a question within your comment. So I save those things, especially the good ones, for a question and answer videos. So I think I might address some of those questions later on today after I finish my module. And maybe while I'm on the way to find some, um, I have to go grocery shopping. I might go to Costco. There's the thought. It's Tuesday afternoon. Who's going to Costco? So maybe I'll answer some questions for you while I'm on the way to Costco. All right, I'll see you there. What do you think? It's a wooden clog that fits me. There's a pair of them. <laughs> There's this little carved wooden cat that it's in a position that Buddy gets in frequently. I don't need it, but it's $2.99. I have to look up these candle holders. There's two of them here. It's like Buddha heads in Lucite or something. I have to look those up. Isn't this pretty? It's like, it's, oh, it's kind of broken. But at the same time, I think I like it. I have to look that up too. I love this goose-shaped planter. That'd be fun for a plant. Oh, this would be cute too. Like a spider plant growing out of her head. I think this is by a company called Gans, I think. Yeah, I'm going to leave that for... Well, four dollars. Maybe I'll come. No, I'll put it in the cart just in case. It's a very cool thing. It's a coffee maker. I forget how it's used, actually. Um, I need to look this up. It's by Pyrex, made in France. I used to see this uh, used in a, uh, a coffee shop in New York City. I'm actually going to put this in the cart to look this up and see if it's worth reselling. There's a filter in there. Huh. These things have been bringing a lot of money on eBay, and this is in great shape. It looks like it's hardly being used on the inside, but the edge is broken. And they want 25 for this one, that's too much. And no lids here. Is this something? 88 proof corn whiskey, McCormick distilling. It's got the cap. I'll check that out too. Think I should get this for work? Hmm? No. I don't wear polo shirts very often, but I like the color and the print and the price. I might try it on. Hmm. Dutch Brothers Coffee. Oh, there's the windmill. Huh. It says Dutch Brothers on the side. How much is that? 15. Hey, you look that up, see if people buy that kind of thing. Part of me is thinking of grabbing this. It's a, apparently a vintage um, ski sweater by a company called Triolia. I've never heard of them, but they sell on eBay for like 40 45 bucks. They want $8 for it, so I think I'll leave it. 
They just put this out. Now, if you are as old as I am, remember that this was the highest end you could possibly get, you know, years and years and years ago. It has both remotes. It has the manual. Uh, it's in great shape. Uh, they want $40 for it, though. Uh, but looking at this on eBay, I mean, some of them are listed for as high as $700. Some have sold for as uh, about $300. A few have sold for less, but I'm, I'm going to plug it in and see if it works. And I might run a, I might tr uh, gamble on this one. And there's a seven day return policy on electronics if it doesn't work at home. But yeah, well, I'm going to think about this. I'm putting all of this stuff back. I'm actually going to put this back as well. I could sell this on eBay for probably $75 to $100, this coffee thing. It's from the 40s, and I don't think it's really honestly ever been used. But the cork, which is in good shape, I can't get the top out of the bottom, and I'm afraid to break it. I also can't unscrew this. It's, like, wedged in there solid. So um, as much as that could be money, I'm going to leave it behind because I don't want to break it just trying to take it apart. Uh, I'm going to take the garlic keeper um, and I am going to buy this. I'm going to give it a spin. Um, it looks like it works. And if the sound is good as I remember it to be, it'll be definitely a great addition to my house or I can resell it. But uh, yeah, everything else is going back. One more reason I was thinking of shaving my mustache and beard. I am a confused with a senior citizen all the time. Now, I was just at Goodwill. And she's like, oh, you discount. I'm like, I don't get a discount yet. Two weeks, I'll get a discount because I'll be 55. But everyone has assumed I am way older than I am. But I don't know. I don't know. I'm still tempted. Hey there. So I'm not going to Costco today. Um, it is way too late in the day. Traffic there and back would be very frustrating. Uh, and um, yeah, so I'm not going to go to Costco. Um, I am going to go to Marshalls and try and find a pair of shorts though. But I did write down some questions on my card here that some of you guys have asked me that I thought were really, really great questions I have been saving up for potentially a video just like this. So let's answer some questions, shall we? The first is by uh, someone with the name H-M-B-I-S, S, Humbus. Um, what are the airlines looking for when interviewing flight attendant candidates? Uh, any tips? Well, right off the top of my head, the first th thought I had was presentation. Um, I've only worked two hiring events, but having been a flight attendant for a number of years, I think I've got a good grasp on what they're probably looking for. First would be presentation. Do you present yourself as a professional? Can you speak clearly? You don't have to yell, but you know, can people hear you, understand you? Are you dressed appropriately for the event? Uh, is your behavior professional? You know, um, uh, if you're at the interview or the uh, during the the process of being interviewed because that can take 12 14 hours or a couple days uh, are you on your phone when you shouldn't be you know just professionalism in general but when you first start chatting with people uh, and maybe when you're talking to the people around you at the event because they're watching every move you make um, are you social can you make an, uh, a quick rapport with people around you that is incredibly useful. As a flight attendant, I've got sometimes 10, 15 seconds to suss the situation and look around at what's going on and the behavior of the people around me and sort of read the room like this in order to respond appropriately to a situation, be it a medical emergency, someone who may potentially be intoxicated, or some, when I'm asking someone to help me out in a situation. I have had to ask passengers to assist uh, uh, with certain situations on aircraft. So having, a, a, being able to develop a, I mean, uh, if you have a quick immediate rapport, which I'm not having right now, really, really important. Uh, and um, a good resume will go far. You can sort of massage a resume uh, to the flight attendant position by including things like customer service and 
safety. Safety isn't something that's normally highlighted in most resumes, but it is crucial that you get across to the interviewer that um, you are capable of things like handling situ medical situations, things like that. Now, if you can have any job on your resume and find a way to discuss safety. If you're a server at a restaurant, do you know the Heimlich maneuver, which is not called the Heimlich maneuver anymore? Do you know CPR? Uh, do you know how to manage your environment? Is the floor slippery, for example, in the kitchen or in the restaurant? Um, is, you know, cutlery being handed to a three-year-old? You know, you know how to look for safety situations in that job. As a driver, an Uber driver, I mean, you have to drive defensively, be aware of your environment, be aware of your speed, be aware of the GPS and the passenger behind you. There's ways to, uh, to look for safety in pretty much every position you've held. So try to sort of tuck those things into your resume without it looking like you're trying to be synthetic about your experience, you know what I mean? Uh, so rapport, uh, professionalism, safety, and uh, customer service to a degree. Uh, I don't think customer service is as important as people think it is because the airline's going to give you some direction. But if you can, you know, if you can develop that rapport, use it as a, a tool. Uh, and I, yeah, I think customer service is a nice backup skill. Uh, but those are things I def definitely would sort of say they're looking for during the interview process. Um, any uh, tips? There's tons and tons of videos on how to get a job as a flight attendant. My first few months as a YouTuber were dedicated completely to getting the job as a flight attendant. So go ahead and take a look at my older videos for thing, for just tips. Ash is fun asks, uh, uh, do I have any thoughts on leaving a cushy nine to five job? Because I think they're leaving uh, a standard nine to five position. Let me get in the sun here. Uh, for one of a flight attendant. First, I don't know, honestly, the question makes me think about it in, more in terms of uh, anxiety of leaving a stable position where you know your hours, you know when you're supposed to be at work, you know what your expectations are. All those things are known in a nine to five job where the job as a flight attendant is pretty much built on the formation, uh, the foundation of chaos. Every minute of every day has potential for chaos as a flight attendant. I'm sorry, this light is crazy bad. Um, so I think that's what the question's probably more about. Uh, and my response to that would be, uh, I have never had a regular nine to five job or a scheduled position where I had say five days a week, I've never had a job that I found cushy. There was always a supervisor looking at every single moment, uh, every, every inspecting every bit of my work, uh, you know, a, a super, every manager I've ever had in sales primarily has been looking at my numbers. You know, am I making my quota? Um, how many credit card applications did I submit? Blah, 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 blah. And the constant having to be with the same people every day, all day in the same chair, blah, blah, in front of the same register. Um, the freedom of being a flight attendant is balanced. I, well, I can't even say it's balanced. The freedom you have as a flight attendant honestly is unmatched in the sort of nine to five, five day a week job. So, um, yeah, I would say just jump. Honestly, if you are in a position where you can become a flight attendant, and I mean that financially and socially, if you can afford to make no money for a couple of years, <laughs> if you're in a position where you don't have to worry too much about a mortgage or school payments or loan payments, things like that, just do it, do it. And, and um, I don't know many people who regret becoming a flight attendant. YouTube is full of videos of primarily young women saying, I quit my job as a flight attendant because, and uh, there's there's thousands of them. And I think that honestly, those videos are built on, on trying to get views, honestly. Uh, but those people who quit 
and regret becoming flight attendants, they weren't supposed to be flight attendants in the first place. <laughs> they just weren't. Um, so I hope that answered that question. Um, Amy, how do I keep my energy up to do my job? How do I stay awake on long flights? I think my motivation is probably um, stems from my passengers and my guests. I'm on stage. That's really it. That's, that's probably the primary thing. I'm on stage the entire time. Passengers are always watching you. So that is great inspiration to not lollygag, and it's great inspiration to not slack uh, or make mistakes or do the wrong thing because they're always watching you. It's like having children, I think. So having that uh, motivation to keep going, to keep doing what I'm supposed to do is important. The fear of losing my job also comes into play when it comes to like being tired. If I'm exhausted and I can't keep my eyes open, I have to do, let me get in the path of the sun here. I have to do something to stay awake because if I fall asleep, I could lose my job. <laughs> so that's motivation right there. Um, and I just happen to love my job. Most of my coworkers are amazing. Most of my passengers are amazing. And that's really motivating. And I, and I really just, I really just enjoy my job. So it's easy to sort of do that. Um, also I've learned to sleep when I have to, when I can, when I need to. Um, and, um, sleep cause sleep is very difficult as a flight attendant and eating. I still haven't mastered eating, but, um, yeah, uh, it's, it's, uh, my motivation to, to stay awake and all those things, mostly cause people are watching. I love my job and I, uh, I used to drink epic amounts of coffee or caffeinated beverages to stay awake. I sometimes... Uh, will in an emergency situation take a caffeine pill. It's a little tablet that has a hundred milligrams of caffeine. Not a lot. It's like a Red Bull, and I buy that at the Dollar General. Uh, but that's only under dire emergencies, like when I'm sitting in the jump seat and I can feel my eyelids closing. Um, yeah, I'll take a little caffeine. So that's definitely a way to <laughs> a way to stay awake. I'm sorry for my angle here. I'm trying not to have you be blinded by the sun. Um, red light. J.S. Underberg, how do I feel about the financial situation of my airline? Um, you know, we're not in the best of situations, but other airlines are also in a similar situation. Um, I'm not worried at all, honestly. The merger was, if you didn't see or hear, the merger finally uh, was squashed. Both parties, uh, my airline and JetBlue, have agreed to cease uh, uh, the attempt to merge. Uh, that airline, JetBlue, is going to, I forget how much it is, they're going to pay us like $69 million or something. Our stockholders received a certain amount of money, uh, as was in their, the contract for the merger. Um, I don't think that $69 is going to erase our last year's performance, but, um, we are a very small airline and very flexible and we've got, um, all the tools I think that we need to do whatever has to be done. I trust, oh, this is going to be hard to say because sometimes I don't right now. I trust, um, the, uh, executive team. And um, I don't think there's a way that our airline's going to fail immediately or even in the near future. If, if our airline goes under for some reason, it's going to be a very long time from now. It's going to be a very long time from now. So I'm not worried at all. Uh, the next part of that same person's question was, um, am I afraid of losing my job at my age? I, yeah, I think anybody my age would be worried or anxious about their their position. Uh, but um, it is really hard as a flight attendant to lose your job. <laughs> it is very difficult to be fired as a flight attendant. I have to do something very, very wrong, very, 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 very wrong, put someone's life at risk uh, in order to be fired. Um, and to get to that point, I, I mean, even if I make a, a number of serious mistakes, 
Uh, I have a union uh, that will back me up as long as I didn't do anything willful or incorrect or, you know, against the rules. Uh, but, um, yeah, there's always a, a, a recourse. There's always something that can be done before I get to a point where I lose my job. So, uh, and I think that the origin of that question, am I afraid to lose my job at my age, is tied with the other part of the question they asked was, am I afraid about the financial situation of our company? So uh, I am not at all worried about losing my job because of the company's financial situation right now. Um, any uh, airline that's been through furloughs, we've never done furloughs yet. Not saying it couldn't happen, but um, any company that has needed to, you know, cut their budget down can furlough people. I am in the top 22, 23% of my company, even if that, that would mean we'd have to furlough like three and a half, four thousand flight attendants before I had to worry about losing my job. So, yeah, I'm not worried at all. It's great. It's. <laughs> <laughs> it's great to be this at peace with my position and my job. All right, we're at another red light. We can look at another question here. Uh, let's see. 808 something. Have I stayed at a haunted hotel? The hotel in Baltimore, the Laura, I almost said the name of the name, hotel. The hotel in uh, Baltimore is supposed to be one of the most haunted hotels in the in the country and uh, I, I've only stayed there once. I can't say I experienced anything supernatural but the um, heating grate fell off the wall uh, in the middle of the night. Apparently the same thing happened to my coworker around the same time so I found that to be a little suspicious plus um, the room was probably about 72 73 degrees. I was very very comfortable in my room. Let me plug my phone in here because it's gonna lose power. I was very comfortable in the room wearing almost no clothing or maybe potentially no clothing. I'm not gonna tell you. But the minute I got in bed, I was freezing, freezing, shivering. I doubled the blankets up. I folded them in half and doubled them and put them on top of me and I was still shivering. I don't know how I went to sleep. I was so cold and I never warmed up. Uh, and I found that to be very strange that that one spot in the room, I was ice cold. Uh, and you know, they always say that, you know, the temperature changes when there's potentially a spirit around. So that, you know, who knows if that was a supernatural experience, I'm not sure, but that was my only experience with potentially being in a haunted hotel. Uh, let me see if I can put you guys on pause for a moment because I don't see a red light in my immediate future. One moment. All right, so the next question is going to be anonymous. Um, their name was up there at some point, but I'm, I'm gonna just say it's still anonymous. Any tips on quitting drinking? Well, that's not uh, really a, a lightweight thing that I can just spout out on the road, but um, I've made two videos regarding my drinking uh, and my recovery into becoming a sober person. Um, those were, videos were made a long time ago where I shared something of my story as, a, as an active alcoholic and what it took to get me to the point where I needed to be sober. Uh, and then I made a video about what it was like getting sober. Um, but if I were to say just real top off the top of my head, any tips on quitting drinking, especially when you know you have to, if you have tried already, you already know you want to stop drinking. Uh, the big, the big one, and this is, I don't want to sound flippant. I don't want to sound smart. Stop drinking. Don't drink. If you think you have to cut your fingertips off your hands each time you want to take a drink, cut your fingertip. I'm kidding. Don't. But I mean, stop drinking. Don't take the next drink. You don't have to. Your brain is going to tell you to. Your body's going to tell you you have to. You're going to start shivering. You're going to, you might want to throw up. You might go into a seizure. I don't know. Then maybe have a shot. I'm just saying. But um, if you know you have to stop drinking, find a way to stop drinking. I tried to not drink thousands of times. I don't think there was a day 
that I didn't say I need to stop drinking three or four times for years in a row. Years in a row. I tried to not drink forever until I stopped drinking. It's, uh, yeah. And for me, that meant going to a meeting of what you might might think of as Alcoholics Anonymous, for example. Um, I had to go into, this is the longest roundabout route to get to, to, uh, to um, Marshalls. I had to join a group of other people who were trying to stay sober. And um, I had to witness other people staying sober. Uh, and I had to witness other people also getting sober. The magic trick for me uh, in the recovery program that I practice, which might be Alcoholics Anonymous, it might not be, um, is to remember that everyone in that room is playing a part in everybody else's sobriety. Nobody I've ever met got sober alone. So somebody else helped me stay sober, and in helping me stay sober, they stayed sober. It's a magic trick. It really is. Uh, and then when I was helping other people stay sober, I magically stayed sober. So um, number one, don't drink. If you can't not drink, go to a rehab. Go to somewhere where you can't drink. <laughs> And hopefully, right after that, you take some of those tools that you learned, hopefully, in that that uh, rehab or something, is to go to a, a recovery meeting. A lot of people say it doesn't work. It's worked for millions and millions of people since 1935, for example, in Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, and it's been relatively simple for me. I'll, I'll tell you, there's a ton of people getting sober. Go look at Nika at uh, a, a, a gal without a plan or with no plan. She's been sober for just about six months, and she was apparently a pretty serious drug addict. So, blah, blah, blah. Don't drink. <laughs> Ask for help. Go to meetings. Those are the magic things. And help other people. Um, yeah. So, I hope that helps. I hope it helps. Um, let's see. Can I call out fatigued? Does crew scheduling catch that beforehand? <laughs> There's a hard no on that one. Can I call out, um, does that give me points? So fatigue is something that was in the past couple years introduced to, um, to flight attendants as a part of our toolbox to stay healthy and safe. So for example, if I'm on a layover and there's construction work happening at all hours and I am not able to get appropriate rest to, to do my job safely the next day. Uh, and there's a, there's any number of reasons one would be fatigued. If your rest was interrupted by a fire alarm and you had to evacuate the you know aircraft, uh, if uh, you had to work a uh, maximum shift of 15 hours and then you only had eight or nine hours of rest before your next trip. There's all sorts of reasons that one would be fatigued. I would call crew scheduling and I would call out fatigued. I, and it's, um, there's actually an option for, you know, press number nine for fatigue, whatever it is. So I can call out like I'm calling out sick, but I'm calling out fatigued. There'll be a code on my schedule that, I think it's FTG, it might be FTG, I forget, I don't know what it is, I've never called out fatigued yet, uh, but there's a code that is put on your schedule, on my schedule, and once a month, there is a uh, panel made up of different people. Some of them are flight attendants, some are union people. I think there's company people involved. And what they'll do is they will go over the report that you write supporting the reasons that you're fatigued. They'll go over that and they'll determine whether or not to approve that fatigue call. If, for example, you're, the reason you were fatigued is that you were commuting to work. You couldn't get two or three, you couldn't get to work using two or three flights. So you finally got to the airport and you uh, were too tired to actually work your trip. Or if it's a reason that you honestly isn't supported by any real evidence uh, that was out of your control, 
uh, that fatigue call will turn into a sick call and they'll use your sick hours uh, to to um, pay you. Uh, and you are you're pay protected if it's fatigue, if it's really fatigue. Um, I hope this is making sense. If it is a honest fatigue call and they've approved it as a fatigue, uh, you don't acquire any points for that uh, call. That's what I understand. If it's not approved, if honestly you're just trying to get out of working or you just, you just you're tired and it's with something in your control uh, and it's turned into a sick call, you do get those points. Uh, for that sick call, and if it was you were you were calling during your trip, during your pairing, or within within two hours of originally your your pairing, uh, then you would get in my company three points. Uh, if it was um, you wouldn't call out fatigue before your trip, so yeah, it would be three points. Uh, so yes, would crew scheduling see catch that before it happened? No, no, there there. No, there is no way that crew scheduling would ever bother to think about your needs. <laughs> Not to be negative, but crew scheduling isn't wondering about you and your health. Um, they're just um, looking at your contract. Are you legal to do what they have yet? They need you to do. Um, I, I've only I've never met anybody in crew scheduling who's ever been concerned about a fatigue call. Um, so yeah. That, that's not going to happen. That would be nice. That would be that would be amazing, but that's never going to happen. Um, let's see. What is it about Marcus, my friend Marcus, that keeps us close, even though we don't see each other very often, that I don't feel for other people? Does that quite that? Do you understand the question? My friend Daniel asked that question. It's a very perceptive question. Um, I don't have a lot of friends, actually. I would say Marcus is probably, he's not my only friend, but he's, he's, it's, it's a very short list. It's a very short list. Um, Marcus, I have known Marcus since 1992, I think, 1993, possibly. Marcus and I were opposites. Um, I'm tall, he is short, I had dark hair, he's blonde. Um, just, I, uh, he was little, he was a tiny, tiny, tiny person. He was so thin. I'm not saying he isn't now, but he was so thin and I was always kind of chunky and beefy. Um, we just, we were complete, complete physical opposites and personality wise, I'm big and loud. I'm a symbol crasher and he is very subtle and under the radar and he can, you know, if you go to a concert and you're watching the concert and there's this little person who's just slipped right in front of you and stood in front of you in the concert because they're just, that's Marcus. He can slide right in anywhere. He's just, he's, uh, he's, uh, he, we're just so, we're so different. And I think at one point that was probably what attracted us, our differences. The other is that we share uh, a similar appreciation for things of the 70s and the 80s, pop culture, we, we agree and appreciate some of the same things. Uh, and um, But um, Marcus and I both share a lot of negative things in common. Our addictions are similar, different in ways, but similar in others. Our reactions to pretty much everything I'm in the wrong parking lot, um, are um, similar. We, <laughs> we have both seen each other at our absolute worsts. Marcus has seen me completely inhuman. I, he has seen me in, in positions, in the attitudes and situations that weren't even human. Uh, and he still loved me. And, and, um, he didn't judge me because he was actually probably doing the same exact thing. Uh, so we live with each other, uh, each other's uh, similarities and differences without judgment. Uh, and I want to say it is pretty much um, 
there, there's nothing that Marcus could do that would really ever make me dislike him or hate him. He's made me mad, and I've pissed him off. Uh, but I don't know. There's something about Marcus and our shared trust in each other that I've never experienced with any. Now, I don't trust anybody in the world outside of my sponsor, my friend Lex. <laughs> I haven't talked to him in a long time. I don't trust anyone like I trust Marcus because Marcus will always have my back. We don't we don't have to talk for years, but no matter what in the world, if anything happened, I could trust Marcus to be there for me. And he knows the same would be true of me. I hope. I hope. I love him and I don't love I don't love many people. So, I'm going to start uh, getting emotional. <laughs> When I tell you Marcus has seen me in the middle of things that I, that you couldn't even possibly imagine, it's true. And he still liked me. It's nice. It's nice. I hope you find someone like that in your life. Uh, it's a shame Marcus and I weren't really attracted to each other because that would be amazing. If we could be boyfriends, <gasps> that would be amazing. We'd be great, but I think we both find each other. Yeah, no, that would be like two, two sisters going at it. It, it wouldn't work. Uh, let's see. Why I got a couple left here before I pop into Marshall's. Oh, there's a Goodwill over there too. Huh. I might go in. Um, <clears throat> Megan, car seats. I may have talked about this already. Car seats for infants or toddlers, are they necessary or just a hassle? Any recommendations? Yeah, so if you have a car seat and you don't think you're going to use it on an aircraft, buy one of those big red protective um, pull bags to stow it in so you can leave it at the bottom of the jet bridge. The ground crew will grab it and it will remain safe and very visible so when it comes out you'll know which one's yours. Um, are they uh, 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 necessary? If you have a short, short flight and you have an infant or a newborn and you don't mind holding that baby during that flight, that short flight, then check the car seat, you know, hold the baby because it's, it's nice. Uh, if it's a toddler and you think that that car seat feels like a safe, protected space for them, um, that it would be familiar and make it more comfortable and easier to handle what could be a complicated long flight, I would certainly use a car seat for a toddler. Very much like I think of my cats. When they got my cats into my new, my condo when it was brand new, I thought my cats would be so happy to have all this space. They were terrified and they hid in a corner because they were, they were, they didn't feel safe. It was a big, open, scary place. So potential for a car seat, that could be a safe place for a toddler who is unsure of their environment. So I would probably use the car seat there. Um, now, if I had a baby, <clears throat> if I had a newborn, a toddler, or a you know a, a, a young child, I would use a car seat every single time. I would buy a ticket uh, to take to make sure that seat was available for my child. I would use a car seat every single time. I would never, if it were me, I'm going to get emotional. If it were me, I would never hold my baby on an aircraft unless I was breastfeeding or something, which I can't. Um, I would never, have I made that clear? I would never have a baby unsecured on an aircraft, ever. Turbulence, if I have a baby in my arms, and God help those people who are like, oh, let me raise my baby up because they're going to giggle. Maybe they can touch the body. I, every time I see that, my my jaw clenches because if that plane does this, whoop, 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 that baby could go flying. It could hit its head on the top here. You could drop it. There's a seat right there in front of you with a, with a hard ta tray table. There are so many instances where a child could get injured. If there was a, an unfortunate, I won't say airplane crash, I won't say it, any incident, but if a plane, the wing of a plane were to clip another one on the uh, runway, which happens, things like that happen, the inside of that cabin is going to be thrown around. 
Do you want your baby to go flying? No. So I know that I sound dramatic right now, but I would never have my baby in my lap in an airplane. That would just never happen because I love, I would, I would want my child to be as safe as possible. I can't tell you the number of things that could potentially happen on an aircraft. I, no one has asked me this question, but to go along with that, I would ask myself the question, would you ever, would you wear your seat, seat belt on an aircraft from the beginning to the end? Yes. I would, if I were going to talk to a new person who's never flown before, I would say you leave that seatbelt buckled every single moment you're on that plane. If you have to get up to go to the bathroom, unbuckle, get up, go. I made a video about how to go to the bathroom. Get back to your seat, sit down, buckle. Because clear air turbulence can happen like this out of the blue. No one knows that's going to happen. Bam. Break your nose. Um, I did. Anything could happen on an aircraft. So I would leave my seatbelt buckled every single minute I was on that aircraft. When we're on the ground, it's all the more important because that is the most dangerous time to be on an airplane. Have I scared you? Um, all right, so I think I've got more. Can I, I got one more question, then I'm going to go into um, Marshall's Red Bug Gaming. Is that your name? If you commute to work, can can you use other airlines to commute to work? And is it free or do you have to pay? So for a commuter in the domestic, on domestic flights, uh, we are allowed, every airline, uh, mm, barring maybe one or two, can fly on any other domestic carrier to commute for work and it is free. There is no charge. You just have to hope that there's a seat for you. If you're traveling for pleasure, um, internationally, there is uh, something called a Z fare. You basically pay the taxes for your flight. You don't pay for the ticket so much, but you do pay what's called a Z fare, which is which is the, the the tax you would normally pay on a flight, which is just a small fraction of what that ticket would probably cost you. But domestically, pretty much every flight attendant has. Um, uh, flight benefits on pretty much every carrier. Um, my airline, uh, it was a surprise to me when, when I found out we, we cannot travel internationally for pleasure on Delta or American. It used to be, uh, uh, United used to be included in that, but we recently got benefits, international benefits with United recently, so that's nice. Uh, but domestically, you don't pay for anything. Uh, so if you're trying to commute on your own airline, which is always easier because uh, you have precedence over other people, um, that's definitely the way to go. But if you can't fly on your own equipment, then flying with another airline is fine and you don't pay for that. So that's that's a really nice benefit. Uh, would I suggest commuting? Oh, hell no. Never, ever, never, never, never. I would, you would catch me dead commuting um, because I'm just too lazy. It is a, it's practically a part-time job um, commuting to work and I just couldn't do it, um, especially on reserve. But, oh, speaking of reserve, this is my second day of reserve. It is a beautiful day here. It's about 65 degrees. Um, uh, today is my second day of reserve. Um, I don't think they're going to call me with my seniority. They're probably not going to call me. But there is that moment of, hmm, I should, I should refresh my schedule just to see if they, they put a trip on my board, but they have not. So, ta-da! All right, let's go into Marshalls. There we go. There's always a police presence outside this Marshalls because there's always shoplifters. But let's go into Marshalls. All right, I found this pair of Asics. They're a five-inch inseam. There's a little pocket for my keys, and I can put my wallet in the front pocket. So I'm going to pick those up. 15 bucks, and they look they look comfortable. And I'm going to buy one of these. If you've seen my videos of me in the house or the bedroom, you know my cats. I, I have, like, 
six of these in the house, these cardboard bowl scratcher things, but this one is larger than most of them. And uh, they both seem to enjoy the larger one rather than the smaller ones I have. So I'm gonna buy this and toss one of the um, smaller ones. They're gonna like this a lot. See, this is around the size of one of the ones I have at the house. You can see that there's a pretty significant size difference. So the cats will fit better in, in this one than the smaller one. Well, I didn't buy anything at Marshall's. I walked out of the store, left the cart. I was rude. I should have put everything back. But um, I was standing there in line for probably 25 minutes. The wine cashier, she's like moving along. Yeah, just ridiculous. I don't need to spend money right now. So I saved some money. Thank you, Marshalls. <laughs> Am I hungry? I just left Marshalls. I was on my phone, futzing around on Facebook, looking at YouTube. I look up and the line hasn't moved. I was in line for maybe 20 minutes and the line had not moved. There's one cashier, she's got her thumb up her nose. Not really, but, uh, and um, there's just this, I don't know. It was way too much. I was not willing to stand in line any longer. So I said to the cashier, can I leave this with you guys? The car, I only had two things in it. And she said, yeah, and she looked confused. I'm like, thanks, bye. So I'm at uh, Target. How cute it is close. So cute. Uh, because I know I can find something here and it's self-checkout. I can, I can do that. Oh, I was so frustrated. Just what I wanted, a pair of short black shorts with a back pocket and two deep front pockets. Very handy. Let's get you set up here. So I've just been watching these video clips I've put together for you. And I realized this video is going to be super duper long. So I'm going to end this here. Uh, the plan for the rest of the night is to go home, get a bite to eat, give the cats their evening treats, and then settle in. Maybe watch another module. I'm not sure. But then go to bed nice and early. That's my day. So thanks for joining me. I hope you sort of enjoy this, this question and answer portion of my videos. And I'll see you again very soon. All right. Fly safe. Bye.